Hello, my name is Mark Cannon, and I'm here today to talk about uh, Horatio Cook and my book, Lincoln Scout, which is the diary of Horatio Cook, soldier, spy, escape artist. Now, this all began when I was 20 years old back in 1981. And even though I've made a career in law enforcement, I also performed magic with my wife for many, many years. In 1981, I got a call to do a magic show for Christmas, December of 81, for a uh, old retirement, uh, a group of older people, a retirement center in Yucaipa, California, which is where I am right now. So I performed this show. While performing this show, at the very end of my show, uh, a woman about 85 years old by the name of Clara Louise Wassum eagerly volunteered. She wanted to be part of this uh, show. She wanted to be a volunteer for the magician, which was kind of strange having someone that old that wanted to come up and, and be a part of it. But as I would find out, that uh, young lady made it quite clear that she was very keen to magic. And the reason why she was keen is because she was the daughter of the great American wizard, Major Harry Cook. Well, we're talking about Horatio Cook. She would explain to me that her dad actually was a mentor of sorts to another guy, another Harry um, magician by the name of Harry Houdini. And as fascinating as this was, it wasn't nearly as fascinating as what she went on to tell me both during the show and later after the show. And that is that her father had actually uh, been a participant in the American Civil War. Now, first of all, right then I had to stop and try to do the math. Well, her dad had been born in 1844, which made him prime age for the Civil War. And not only had her, her dad been a, a member and a, a participant in the Civil War, he had some extremely unusual uh, things that he done he did during the war. One of them was, as she explained, he was made a scout by none other than President Lincoln. Secondly, he had actually performed a rope escape for President Lincoln, which we'll talk more about in a moment. And he also was there at Ford Theater to witness the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Now, as amazing as all this is, it was kind of still hard for me to believe this until uh, Clara Louise showed me and then later actually gave me her dad's scrapbook, and she lent me his diary and several other articles that we'll get to in a moment to uh, this validate uh, her dad's uh, story. Now, why did she give me this stuff? Well, her only son, uh, Clara's only son had died during World War II, and she knew that she wasn't long uh, remaining in the world. And she asked me that uh, in uh, return for uh, giving me these articles that I would please someday write a book telling the remarkable story of her father. Well, it only took me 40 years, but uh, I finally did. And that's the book we're gonna talk about now, Lincoln Scout, The Diary of Horatio Cook, Soldier, Spy, and Escape Artist. So at this point, I would like now to present for all of you a, a PowerPoint presentation on Major Harry Cook, the American wizard. Now, Harry Cook, had been born in 1844 in Norwich, Connecticut. This is the youngest known photograph of Harry Cook, which was in his uh, scrapbook that Clara gave me, his daughter. In this photo, he's about 30 years old. And at the time of the Civil War, he was in fact 20. But you can roughly see uh, what Harry Cook looked like. Well, he had been born in 1844 in Connecticut. About 10 years later, his family moved to first to Chicago and then a couple years after that, ultimately to uh, Harrison County, Iowa. And at the age of 17, in 1861, about the time that the Civil War broke out, Harry Cook, who was a, an absolute genius, had been made actually a school teacher at a country school. And he was, he was made that because he had this uh, ingenious ability uh, as a Renaissance man, basically, to write. His penmanship was spectacular. In fact, his diary, of which this book that I wrote is based upon and is, and is reproduced within the book, is, was written in beautiful um, Spencerian script, of which I'll show you a sample of in a moment. 
Well, the Civil War broke out, and, and this is Norwich, Connecticut, where he's from. And the Civil War broke out, and a year later, in 1862, uh, Harry Cook joined, signed up for the U.S. Army and became a member of the 20th Infantry Iowa Company and Company B, August of 1862 in Marengo, Iowa. At that time, um, Harry Cook, he also took with him, by the way, one of his brothers, Nathan, and several of his pupils from his class, incidentally. This, this little sketchy photograph here of the 20th Iowa Regiment, uh, somewhere in that photo is Harry, his brother, and his pupils. They then, uh, after going through boot camp, marched off to war. Now, as I stated earlier, Harry Cook, his, his given name was Horatio Green Cook, but he went by Harry. Harry had immaculate, beautiful penmanship of which this particular letter here that I'm showing is a, a great example. You can see his signature at the bottom. Well, his, uh, his beautiful writing ability would among other things, get the attention of those in charge of him. And as such, he would find himself doing correspondence for several generals, Rosecrans, Grant, Sherman, and others. And it would finally, his, uh, his, uh, his penmanship, and his sharpshooting skills would become known back in Washington. And it was in 1863, in the spring of 1863, that Harry Cook would become, with a personal letter from Abraham Lincoln, would be made what a so-called special scout. Now this photograph that was up here from the uh, newspaper, I'm zooming in on, if you look real close, you can see this medal that says Lincoln Special Scout of 1863. Now, of course, this photo is back when he was uh, taken much here, uh, many years later. But the point being, it's one of the uh, few remaining artifacts that substantiate uh, uh, Cook's claim to have been made a uh, special scout by Abraham Lincoln. Well, in 1863, during the siege of uh, Vicksburg, and then following thereafter with the Red River campaigns, Harry Cook and his men would do much scouting duty and also uh, for Grant as well. After the Red River campaigns, Harry Cook then uh, went, was detached from the army, given the brevet rank of, of uh, captain, although his men called him major, just for as a uh, term of endearment. And uh, prior to uh, the spring of 1864, prior to the, Sh um, the Shenandoah campaign, Harry Cook found himself dispatched to Washington on special assignment. It was during this time that Harry Cook was sent to Washington, D.C., along with uh, several famous uh, men, Hancock, Sherman, uh, uh, Stanton, Ingersoll, and others, to meet none other than President Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln, many people may not be aware of it, Abraham Lincoln was a great fan of magic, uh, and so was his wife. <laughs> now, during this time, and, and as written in Harry's uh, diary, he met with Abraham Lincoln, and, and Harry, uh, Abraham Lincoln said, I, I understand, young man, that you are quite tricky. Well, this newspaper article, which recounts the story I'm about to tell you, which was uh, much later in life in 1923 during the retelling of this event. If you look at this little cartoon picture above this drawing of Harry Cook, you see an artist rendering of President Lincoln giving this young Civil War uh, soldier, Harry Cook, a $2 bill. This $2 bill, Abraham Lincoln gave to Harry Cook as a thank you for this magic trick or really an escape trick that uh, Harry Cook did for Abraham Lincoln. The trick was this. He, Abraham Lincoln uh, asked him to do this trick and the trick was this. He had several men, Hancock, Ingersoll and others, tie him up, tie, tie Harry Cook up with, with uh, about 50 feet of rope. Harry Cook then asked Abraham Lincoln to take 10 paces away from him, to turn around and walk back toward him. When he walked back toward him, he threw uh, Abraham Lincoln the rope, having escaped from the rope. Now, it's what Abraham Lincoln said to Harry Cook at the end of this presentation that is quite amazing. First of all, he gave him the $2 bill, 
for something to remember old Abe by, as he said. And then Abraham Lincoln said this, and I'm reading right from Harry Cook's diary, which is recount, which is uh, in the uh, book I wrote. And that is this, Abraham Lincoln said, the Johnnies would have to go some to hold you if you should ever fall into their hands. Well, that statement by President Lincoln would prove to be very prophetic just a few months later. And, and regarding that, we'll now jump to October 19th of 1864. Everybody here, of course, is a Civil War buff. That date may ring a bell. October 19th of 1864 will turn out to be um, uh, the Battle of uh, Cedar Creek. Now, at this time, Harry Cook made his way up from D.C. up to Winchester to be with uh, General Sheridan. During that day, as we know from history, um, the Federals fell into a massive retreat as the Johnnies, or the Confederates rather, started pushing, rolling back the uh, Feds back toward Winchester, which was a strategic location that the Southerners wanted to get to open the door to Washington, D.C., having failed the previous two times at Gettysburg and Antietam. Well, the famous ride then commenced and all the uh, survivors of the Battle of Cedar Creek, of which Harry Cook was one, would later recount this at, uh, at uh, reunions that would happen after the war. During that time, as we know from history, um, Phil Sheridan, General Sheridan, would mount up on his uh, horse, grab several men by his own notes, uh, grab several scouts, and do his famous ride, Sheridan's ride, for about 15 miles southbound from Winchester to try to uh, stop his retreating uh, Union soldiers from a total defeat and turn them back to fight the Southerners. It was in this context that Harry Cook, who was not in uniform at the time of this happening, conduct, uh, working as a scout primarily, grabbed six of his own men and rode hell bent for leather alongside uh, Phil Sheridan uh, during this ride to the front. In his own words in the diary, Harry Cook talks and mentions how he could not keep up with Phil Sheridan because Sheridan was such a great horseman. So what they did then is they took to the foothills, uh, that's his own words, Harry Cook's words, they took to the foothills to try to uh, make their way to the front but without being easy, uh, easily seen out in the open. And it was during this time that they would be taken, uh, captured by about 12 of Mosby's guerrillas. When they were captured by Mosby's guerrillas, uh, Harry Cook and his six men, all of them out of uniform, this was during a, a, a very infamous time frame. This was during a time where it was um, tit for tat, take no prisoners, a small min miniature war within a war between Mosby and his uh, guerrillas or partisan rangers and General Custer's cavalry bin. There had been some summary executions on both sides, and it was in this context that Cook would find himself taken prisoner. Now, Harry Cook would later tell the story how when they were captured, they were robbed of everything they had, first of all. About $300 in total between the seven men, Harry and the six guys, uh, about $300 was taken, and from Harry Cook personally, he lost uh, his most prized possession. It was a letter that had been written to him by President Lincoln commissioning him as a scout. He begged to keep that, but uh, as he tells it in his diary, they just kind of laughed him off and said, what, what a great scout you make, you can't even grow whiskers yet. At that time, the uh, Mosby's men began marching Harry Cook and his men, kind of in a northeasterly uh, trajectory, somewhere in the vicinity uh, toward Harper's Ferry. Now, this picture here of Harry Cook obviously was taken uh, many years later in his life, but uh, it's just, it just shows his uniform at the time and some of his medals. But this photograph here, of course, again, was Harry when he was younger. So try to picture this this young man, he's 20 at the time, again, a little over 20, I guess. And, uh, and, and he 
was in charge of his men, although he was just a 20-year-old guy himself. At this time, he feared for his life, naturally, and he recounted his story many years later, which this newspaper article uh, goes into. And here's what happened. They were all tied to trees. He and his six men were all tied to, to trees with their backs literally to the Potomac River. They were told that they were expecting, most of these guys were talking, and they were told that they were expecting another group of prisoners, POWs, in the morning to arrive that were being marched to them. And at that time, all of them were to be summarily executed in retribution for uh, executions that had been carried out by General Custer. It was in this context that Harry Cook found himself. Now, Harry writes in his diary, and it's recounted here, that he felt that he could escape from the ropes. After all, he was a magician, he was an escape artist, and uh, he did feel confident he could get out of his ropes. Well, but what about his men? And also, would they survive that it, without getting shot? Well, he commenced to uh, start his slow escape with the one guard that was posted watching him as, as that guard began to fall asleep. He got himself out of the ropes. He then quietly uh, untied the ropes uh, that were uh, on his own men. And although at one point they considered stealing a gun, they kind of lost their nerve on that and they decided to escape. Now, let me go back here a second. At this time at, of their escape, they had a, their second dilemma. The dilemma was this, do they swim? Do they try to swim across the Potomac at night? The Potomac is a real river, you know, so it's a large river. Or did they try to make their best of it through the Virginia woods and try to get their back to, to friendly forces? Well, three of his men said that they absolutely could not swim. So they decided to go for it best they could through the forest. Harry and three of the other men, they did decide to, uh, attempt to swim across the Potomac. Now I'm going to take a time out and go forward for a second because uh, this is part of the escape portion. Where did, where did Harry Cook learn to get out of ropes? Well, he would later on meet Harry Keller, a famous magician who himself was famous for, for rope escapes that he would participate with the Davenport brothers as a way of pulling off pretend mediumship or pretend a spiritualism supposedly being tied uh, they would summon the ghosts the lights would go out tambourines would ring etc and the lights would come back on and they were all still evidently tied up of course that was just a magic trick the magicians had ways to to get out of the ropes escape do their manifestations and then reinsert their hands in the ropes but the thing is is he didn't uh, meet harry keller till after the war here's the only hint we have about harry cook this article here that, uh, on the screen now is Harry recounting a story as a young man where he had basically been busted for going AWOL. And as punishment, his uh, officer in charge tied his thumbs over a branch of a tree. Well, as the officer retired, he quickly escaped, made some sort of mocking gesture. I'll let you kind of guess what that might be uh, to the retiring officer as the officer left. So the point being that at some point, prior to his time in the Civil War, or right, immediately right during the, the time he first got in, he learned how to escape from ropes. All right, so that would help him escape from the ropes. But now they go for it and they attempt to, to swim the Potomac, while the other three men do their best through the woods. Well, unfortunately, while they were swimming across the Potomac, even though they successfully got across the Potomac, they immediately came across a uh, a canal and the canal was about 60 feet wide according to his diary this canal being on the maryland side of the potomac somewhere in the vicinity of harper's ferry while they were attempting to cross this canal unfortunately one of the men with harry did in fact drown which was quite sad since they had just successfully gotten across the potomac river but um, such is the fate of war i guess once they got across to the other side Harry Cook met up with friendly forces. They were re-equipped with uniforms and guns. He was given about 30 men. Two weeks after this time, Harry Cook and his, his men, now a total of 30 of them, 
cross back into Virginia. They, they wanted to find out what had become to their companions that, that they had left behind that had tried to make it the best way they could through the Virginia woods. Well, unfortunately, they did find them. And where they found them was uh, hanging from trees, hung, dead, shot, and mutilated. Now, this rendered them quite irate, as you might imagine. At this time, Harry Cook would go on what I call his vengeance ride. Now, back up a second here. One thing I didn't mention earlier was an incident that Harry Cook talked about during their time in captivity. Before they had been tied with their backs to the Potomac, somewhere in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry, they evidently stopped for the evening at the uh, farmhouse owned by the father of one of Mosby's men that held Harry and his men captive. Uh, he determined this by remarks made uh, by the father and, the, and one of the uh, captors. During this time, they had been brutalized by uh, the father and the men. Harry himself had been slapped across the face, et cetera. And the father had said, we'll never see you guys again, basically indicating you're going to be executed. Harry had brazenly made the comment, oh, you'll see me again someday. Well, after, back to the story again, after they had found their men hanging there, Harry Cook wanted to carry out some vengeance of his own. So the only place they knew to go to was that farmer's house. Harry and his men went back to that house and he wrote in his diary that uh, they got the man out. Harry returned the favor by slapping him across the face and said, do you recognize me? And he gave the man 20 minutes to get all his belongings out of his house. At that time, Harry and his men burned the house to the ground. They then went on a vengeance ride, and although he never wrote exactly what happened during that vengeance ride, we know this, he turned in horses and guns to the quartermaster at the end of the ride, which kind of insinuates that they probably met up with some of the Southerners and took their vengeance at that time. Well, all this took their toll on Harry Cook. After this was done in the late fall and winter of 1863 and 1864 now, uh, Harry Cook applied for a clerkship, and he was given a clerkship job uh, up in Washington, D.C. But all this time, Harry Cook wanted one thing. With the war winding down, he wanted one thing, and that was to get a new letter from President Lincoln uh, to replace the one that had been stolen from him from Mosby's men. Well, on April 14th of 1865, Harry Cook made his way to the White House where he had been once before and he knocked on the door and asked to see President Lincoln to see if he could get another letter. He was told that Harry, uh, President Lincoln was already down the street at Ford's Theater watching a play by the name of Our American Cousin. So Harry Cook went down to uh, Ford's Theater and in his diary he denotes that he was about 20 minutes late. The play had already begun and now at this point Harry Cook is in uniform. And because he was late for, the, for the, uh, the play having already started, Harry Cook uh, grabbed a, a uh, playbill of Our American Cousin off of the uh, wall, put it in his pocket, and he stood at the back of the theater. Now, I'm sure many of you have been to Ford's Theater before, but if you have not, it's a very tiny, uh, almost a banjo box size of a theater. So this photo, this contemporary photo of the theater kind of shows you where on the far side to the right is the back of the theater and the upper left of course is uh, President Lincoln's booth and Harry Cook was standing at the back of the theater. Well, Harry writes that about 20 minutes in to this play and there's by the way a uh, uh, copy of a playbill that Harry took. That's not the actual one. I did see the actual one he took. It was in his scrapbook uh, that his uh, daughter lent me. There were several scrapbooks. This one was one that was only lent, not given. Uh, about 20 minutes in, Harry Cook hears a gunshot. Now, try to keep in mind that at this point in, in, our, in our history, there had never been a president ever assassinated prior to this moment. So this is the last thing on Harry's mind that, that somebody would have actually shot Abraham Lincoln. He just heard this shot, a play was going on. And in the diary, he, he actually writes that he thought at first 
the shot was part of this or the play. Well, shortly thereafter, he writes that uh, Miss Laura Keene, the, the star actress of the play, uh, herself yelled out, the president's been shot. Well, at that time, he realized, oh, my God, the president had actually been shot by an assassin. Well, um, several people, as we know from history, ran after uh, John Wilkes Booth, but he, uh, he successfully made the escape. Harry Cook, not knowing what to do and having met uh, President Lincoln at least once, possibly twice, that's not quite clear, prior to this time, of course, was in shock like everybody was. And all during that night, Harry Cook kind of hung out in the, uh, in the streets immediately in front of the boarding house, the Peterson boarding house right across the street from the theater, hoping uh, to get a glimpse of President Lincoln. Of course, as we know, Stanton took over. Stanton would not let anywhere anybody near the president. In fact, at one point, Stanton even uh, had Mrs. Lincoln leave the room because she was in such a hysterics. Well, at different times during the night, according to Harry's diary, he pled and pled to see Abraham Lincoln. And in the morning, he says that Stanton did relent and that he let uh, Harry Cook into the room where the now dead president lay. And now I'm gonna read the exact quote that an eyewitness to the dead Abraham Lincoln, Harry Cook wrote in his diary. And here's the quote. In the morning, Mr. Stanton came to the door and seeing me took into the room where the president lay. He removed the covering from his face, a face that was so physically homely and yet so grand and peaceful, but his spirit had passed onto the great beyond. I did not obtain that for which I sought for the master's word was lost. And so Abraham Lincoln, of course, was gone. And uh, Harry Cook never did get a second letter uh, attesting to him being made scout by President uh, Lincoln. Well, after the war, uh, Harry Cook would find himself back in, in uh, Iowa. And uh, he was uh, mustered out later that fall of 1865. He went back to Iowa. And then maybe not immediately, but we know by 1866, he started life as a performing magician. And some of his favorite magic acts then was the Chinese linking rings, a, a trick that is still done today, and another trick called the uh, uh, wine and water. And he also did many of his rope escapes, such as like he performed for President Lincoln. Well, the thing is about performing escapes in that era the art of escape, escape artistry had not yet been invented. It wasn't even a thing. Uh, even though we know that uh, at the turn of the next century, when the 20th century began, Harry Houdini, uh, who was 30 years junior to Harry Cook, would make the art of escape a famous uh, performing art. In Harry Cook's prime, it was not even a, an art form yet. But Harry Cook would actually become the first American magician along with his magic acts to begin performing escapology, the art of escape. This photograph here of Harry Cook taken when he's a young middle-aged guy, I'm guessing around 50 years old or so, shows Harry Cook performing the Chinese linking rings of which I actually came across the actual rings that Harry Cook uh, performed with. Those are a photograph of those are in the book that I have here. You also see that Harry Cook by his fez had become a mason later in life. Well, that photograph was on the back of another photograph of Harry Houdini and Harry Keller uh, in his scrapbook that was given to me by his daughter, which we'll get to in a moment. But Harry Cook at that time, it says that he went on and began doing cabinet work in his magic. Now by cabinet work, I mean, in his era, it was uh, doing these fake spiritualism acts where the performer would be tied up, as I said earlier, and the lights would go out and he'd be put inside this cabinet and then all of these bells would ring, et cetera, and all that. But it was all just a magic act. He never claimed that it was a real, uh, it was a real uh, spiritualism or science. He knew that it was all trick, but a lot of his con contemporaries were performing under the guise of supposedly performing real spiritualism, really contacting the dead. It was in this context that Harry Cook would become the very first magician to openly wage war and take on these, these so-called spiritualists. This beautiful uh, poster that you see before you folded up 
uh, dated from the 1870s, uh, uh, talks about Harry Cook performing his so-called spiritualism outdone act, where he would go on and demonstrate how these fraudulent mediums were taking advantage of the public by uh, claiming to contact the dead. But in fact, they were just performing uh, escape tricks, ringing their bells, et cetera, and uh, reinserting their hands and their chains and their ropes. But the point is, is Harry Cook had figured out a way to perform these escapes. He would later on in life teach many of these arts to a new guy by the name of Harry Houdini, which we'll get to at the end of this uh, uh, talk. Now, Harry Cook talks about many of the exploits of his young life in his diary. This article here talks about another dramatic event in Harry Cook's life, and that was in 1871, August of 1871, where he got into an argument with a man by the name of John Weaver when he was living for a short time in Belleville, Ohio. I, apparently, Mr. Weaver was uh, distributing some uh, literature with disparaging comments about Harry Cook. What those words were, we do not know. I've searched for 40 years. I have not been able to find out what they were, even searching court records. But at one point, Harry Cook and Mr. Weaver are in the street. They're having an argument. Harry Cook demanded that Mr. Weaver give him the uh, letter he was sending around. And Mr. Weaver says, quote, yes, I'll give it to you. And at that point, Mr. Weaver pulled out a gun and shot Harry Cook point blank in the abdomen, the bullet leaving his, his right side. Considering the era, the 1870s, it's an amazing thing that Harry Cook would survive. Incidentally, John Weaver was arrested, tried, found guilty of attempted manslaughter, but only did one year in the state penitentiary. Now, in an era where they used to hang people for stealing horses, it's kind of amazing that Mr. Weaver got off as lightly as he did. But that court document I did find that did go to trial. That is a fact. Harry Cook had been shot and Mr. Weaver was found guilty and did serve one year in prison for attempted murder of uh, Harry Cook. But nevertheless, Harry Cook, not only did he survive, he went on to start his cross-country touring, performing his magic act, his, his spiritualism, debunking act, et cetera, all across America. In fact, this little uh, handbill here that was in his, uh, his scrapbook, if you look at the very top, you'll see it's dated May 23rd, 1874. Well, so only a year after being shot, Harry Cook was already up and performing again. Another thing of interest about this date, so 1874 was the year Harry Houdini was born. Of course, Houdini's real name was Eric Weiss, but the point being, you can see that Harry Cook was a full generation ahead of Harry Houdini with not only his escape act, but also his um, spiritualist debunking act. Now, scattered all throughout the diary and the scrapbook, or I should say, of Harry Cook as are all kinds of articles, handbills, et cetera, of Harry Cook performing his magic and escape uh, uh, the spiritualist debunking act all across North America, including Canada and Mexico. He also had here his invitation to his light seance performance he performed. But again, uh, he did it uh, as a magician, openly acknowledging that this was just an act. It wasn't real spiritualism. But he did develop a background in the so-called dark arts. Well, in 1885, Harry Cook, during the during while he was performing, would meet and marry his wife for the rest of his life, uh, Louise Miller. And later on in life, he would have three sons that would all die in infancy, but he would have two daughters, uh, Emma and Clara Louise. Clem, Emma was born in 1886, and Clara Louise, the woman who I would myself would meet in 1981 as an as an old old lady. Uh, Clara Louise herself had been born in 1895. Now, this photo here from the scrapbook appears to show Harry Cook and his young wife, uh, Louisa, uh, in their clapboard house in Warsaw, Iowa, which is where they first started out their married life together. Only uh, a few years later, after being married in 1889, Harry would start with arguably the, the greatest part of his act. 
and that would be the so-called uh, city of Jerusalem. Now, the city of Jerusalem was a, a three-dimensional panorama of sorts that, when folded out, stood over eight feet tall and was 12 feet wide. And what this was, it was a mechanical marvel and uh, running on electricity. Now, consider the era. That was quite a thing. And these little figurines would move about and tell the story of the city of Jerusalem, little angels, uh, King Herod, uh, camels, even fire would spit from this, uh, this little diorama. And they would travel all across North America as part of their magic act showing this contraption. It was quite a thing in the era well before television and video games. Uh, in fact, later on in his life, his entire family would become a part of this act because uh, first of all, the contraption had been built by his father-in-law. His father-in-law, uh, Mr. John Miller, built it. And then uh, his wife would be the treasurer of sorts. And his two daughters would be kind of the MCs that would narrate this uh, performance as this thing transpired. Well, he, he performed all across North America, as I say. But unfortunately, in 1911, a fire broke out. At this time, this was by the time he had moved to Los Angeles, California, and this fire completely destroyed this beautiful artwork, the so-called City of Jerusalem. It's, it's really too bad because this thing should be in a Smithsonian institution if it were still around. Now, speaking of, of moving to Los Angeles, before he did, Harry Cook, being quite the Renaissance man, had added something else to his, his another feather to his cap. And that is, he got a patent. He devised an item called a rapid coin change uh, changing machine. Here he is pictured holding this device. And what this device was, it was a device that, that was inlaid into the uh, desk next to the cash register. And it allowed the clerk to quickly dole out ch coin change to the uh, uh, customer. Here is a metal plate denoting his uh, patent that was awarded to him on March 24th of 1891 for this uh, creation. And there's more on this device in my book, Lincoln Scout, including the uh, actual patent documents and uh, drawings of this device. So he was quite the Renaissance man. Well, by 1911, he was already in Los Angeles. In fact, in 1907, he first moved out and he lived with his uh, sister for a while. And while out in Los Angeles, he continued performing magic, now as an older man, and he, in, by the time of 1912 coming around, he actually built his own home. Now, this photograph here is taken in front of the house that still exists to this day at 212 Manhattan, Los Angeles, on the front porch of his house here. From left to right, you have Harry Cook, his daughter, Clara Louise, the woman I would meet many years later, her husband, Lester, I also met him, uh, the older sister, Emma, and the mother, or Harry Cook's wife, Louisa. Incidentally, Emma, unfortunately, would die just one or two years after this photo, leaving Clara as the only uh, remaining uh, daughter or son of Harry Cook. Now, as I say, the house still exists today. I went up to it, and here's a photograph of the house today that Harry Cook built in Los Angeles for about $5,000. Right now, it's estimated to be a little bit over $1 million in value primarily because of its location, I suppose. Now, also during this time in Los Angeles, Harry Cook, as I say, continued performing magic. He became a Mason. And here's his professional performing uh, photo you saw earlier. And of course, there's his Mason's Fez. And it was also during this time, along with performing magic, he and his good friend, Harry Keller, this man here, who was at the time, America's leading magician, even before Houdini. In fact, a moment with Harry Keller here. Harry Keller was the inspiration to Frank L. Baum for the wizard in the book that Frank L. Baum wrote, The Wizard of Oz. This man here, Harry Keller. Well, Harry Keller and Harry uh, Cook were good friends. They only lived a couple blocks from each other. And together, they would start with a few other men, too. They would create a society called the LASM, the Los Angeles Society of Magicians back in an era when uh, these, these guilds, so to speak, was quite a thing. Here happens to be a, a letter that Harry Keller wrote Harry Cook in 1917. 
And again, Harry Keller was quite the famous magician in his era. In fact, Harry Houdini looked up to Harry Keller. Seems like everybody was named Harry in those days, Harry Cook, Harry Keller, Harry Houdini to be a magician. Anyway, they were best of buds. And as I say, they only lived a couple blocks from each other. Um, down in the lower right is Harry Keller's address. And on the upper left on Manhattan is Harry Cook's address. And meeting in the middle at Third and Western in Los Angeles was the Mason's Lodge, which is where the Los Angeles Society of Magicians met and were also Harry Cook uh, was a member, as I say, of uh, the Masons. Now, Harry Cook would continue to perform magic right up to the very end of his life, as this photograph attests to. Now, they happen to mention in this little photograph, they, they say he's 81 years old, but that's a mistake. Harry actually died at the age of 80. He never, he never quite saw his 81st birthday. But here he is, in fact, performing uh, for a bunch of kids uh, right near the very end of his life. So he never walked away from performing magic. And here's another photograph as well, attesting to this uh, same bit. Now, and here, oh, by the way, here's a picture of him with the members of the Society of uh, Magicians in Los Angeles at the, one of their guild meetings. Incidentally, there is footage, there is silent film that exists. It's only about a couple minutes long, I've seen it myself, where Harry Cook is featured in the silent film along with his, uh, Harry Keller. Uh, and it's a, a film made by a, a Mr. Ford and it shows him performing some magic. Now, Harry Keller, not Harry Cook, had been the first president of the LA Society of Magicians. But when he died just a couple years later, um, and by the way, Harry Cook was one of his pallbearers, Harry Cook became the president of that guild. Now, about 1919, Harry Cook met this man. This man is Harry Houdini. Now, Harry Houdini was, by that time, the greatest magician in the entire world and certainly America's first superstar in the world of entertainment. This photograph here with Harry Houdini on the left and Harry Keller on the right was in the scrapbook of Harry Cook and it was pasted to the back side of this photograph that I found Harry Cook's photo, the one showed earlier with him wearing his Mason's Fez and performing the Chinese linking rings. So they were all contemporaries and they were all good friends. In fact, um, about a year later, Harry Cook applied to be a member of the Society of American Magicians, which was a nationwide guild. And the president of that guild was Harry Houdini. And here is a letter also from the uh, scrapbook where Houdini accepted his money. And by the way, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's the only known autograph of Houdini anywhere in the entire world where Houdini wrote his signature in crayon. Anyway, so they were good friends. And here's the card given to Harry Cook for membership. And if you look extremely close, center near the bottom, underneath the signature of H. Rhea Fitet, Fitel, you'll see the stamp signature of the president, Harry Houdini, for the, for the named above, which is Harry Cook. Now, Harry Houdini became uh, a very close friend to Harry Cook. Here they are photographed together on the front porch of Harry Cook's address. The little baby is Donald Wassum. Donald Wassum is Lester Wassum and his wife, Claire Louis, Clara, uh, their son. Donald Wassum is their only offspring. Harry Houdini is holding Donald and proud grandpa Harry Cook is looking on. Donald Wassum would later die during World War II. And it's for those reasons that Clara Louise Wassum would many years later after that in 1981, pass along the scrapbook, um, some other articles I'll show you in a moment, uh, to me because she had no offspring uh, to, to pass this stuff on to. Harry Cook, uh, Harry Houdini was taught many rope tying uh, stunts by Harry Cook and how to get in and out of uh, ropes quickly because at this time, Harry Houdini himself was beginning to gather information to write a book about fighting against fraudulent mediums in his era the World War I era. We'll get back to that in a moment. Now, it's important to note 
that although Houdini lived in New York City, every spring he would come out to Los Angeles. And by this time, Harry Houdini was making silent film movies. And when he was out, he would always visit with his buddy, Harry Cook. And this photograph here shows where they had Houdini night featured at this meeting in Los Angeles. And if I do a close up to the very back of this photo, left to right, you'll see a woman upper left, that's Mrs. Houdini, Beatrice Houdini. The next person over is Harry Houdini. The next person over is Harry Cook. And then to the far right is Harry's wife, Louisa. So they were very close friends. Well, anyway, um, during this time, Houdini was developing information to write a book. And that book would become his most famous book he ever wrote, a book called A Magician Among the Spirits by Harry Houdini. In that book, he told the story about how all the fraudulent mediums pull off their fraudulent stunts by basically using a scopology and other trickery. And in that book, he gives credit to one professor, Harry Cook, magician, because Harry Cook passed on to Houdini the same stunts that he uh, learned about during the first golden era of spiritualism, which was the Civil War era the World War I era being the second golden era of spiritualism. In the front of this book, he autographs, to my friend Harry Cook, Best Wishes Houdini, dated May 1st of 1924. This book is among the many things that Clara Louise gave to me, and photographs of them are in um, the book I wrote about Harry Cook. Now, this was May 1st, 1924. Not to be undone, Harry Cook, who was quite the Renaissance man, as I mentioned earlier, went about fabricating a beautiful padlock, basically made out of nuts and bolts, but he plated it. And this is the padlock here featured in this photograph. If you look at the center bottom of this padlock, you see the name H. Cook. This uh, padlock, which by the way, came inside a wooden box that Hook Cook also meant, Harry Cook intended to present to Harry Houdini a year later when he would be coming back in 1925. However, unfortunately, and uh, only a month later, Harry Cook himself would pass away, but not before performing one last show. On May 22nd of 1924, it's written May 29th up here, but the best of my research, the, the talk actually happened on May 22nd. Harry Cook performed his last show, and as he did in his last couple of years of his life, he would perform his shows and his lectures while wearing his Civil War outfit. So in this photograph, it, the very last known photograph of Harry Cook, you see left to right a Boy Scout, a gentleman wearing his Doughboy uh, World War I uniform, Harry Cook wearing his Civil War uniform with all of his medals, including his the highest medal up there, his special Lincoln Scout of 1863 medal, and the gentleman who was uh, running the show in this photograph. Now that, that performance was May 22nd of 1924, but unfortunately, on June 23rd, only a month later, Harry Cook would pass away at the age of 80. Almost immediately, letters would begin pouring in uh, to Mrs. Cook. This one here is from Houdini, uh, having just learned about the death of Harry Cook, who, he, who Houdini himself had been with only one month earlier, et cetera. But by this time, of course, uh, Harry Cook passed away. Uh, I myself with another friend uh, would go to his grave site, find his grave site at Rosedale Cemetery in Los Angeles where he's buried. And then back to the start of our story here, Clara Louise Wassum would die only 13 months after I met her and her husband would die a year later. And such would be the end of the genealogical line of Harry Cook. Well, that is the story of Harry Cook. Uh, he, he is, in my opinion, the untold, one of the untold heroes of the Civil War, having been assigned a special scout by Abraham Lincoln himself, having been, been taken prisoner by Mosby's guerrillas. Because of his escapology ability, he escaped Mosby's guerrillas, and then later on would actually witness the assassination of President Lincoln. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, PowerPoint presentation. And it's a, a promise that I, met, I made to Clara Louise Wassum many years ago to finally write a book 
and tell this amazing story about her dad. And that book is my book, Lincoln Scout, The Diary of Horatio Cook, Soldier Spy Escape Artist. It's available at uh, Amazon Books. And I hope if you want to learn much more, you'll uh, take the time to buy my book. And there's over 100 illustrations and photographs in the book taken mostly directly from Harry Cook's personal scrapbook. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you very much for the honor. Bye-bye.